just been up there? Because today's mission is to learn about breathing. That is our breathing system. What? Leaded tubes with a couple of pink sponges on the end? Well, that's roughly what our breathing system is. Well, what are all these bits? I'll give you a full tour. And here we have the thorax, or the upper body, which contains the breathing apparatus. Hope none of you are eating. This might make you feel a bit yucky. And that's the nasal cavity, where we've just come from. Well, what's that? That's the tube that connects the lungs to the mouth. The trachea. Also known as the windpipe, I believe. Correct. This then splits into two more tubes, which connect up to the lungs. Which brings us neatly back to breathing. Take it away, Callum. Well, Paula, the lungs don't contain muscles, so they can't expand on their own. However, a number of things happen at the same time, forcing air into the lungs. Firstly, the intercostal muscles contract, forcing the ribs upwards and outwards. Then, the diaphragm contracts and flattens. These two opening out movements increase the volume of the thorax. It's this chain of events that draws breath into the lungs. Can we have another look at that? The intercostal muscles contract, the diaphragm contracts and flattens, and air is drawn into the lungs. I see. So air is drawn in as a result of muscular contraction. You've got it. So what happens when we breathe out? The intercostal muscles relax, and the diaphragm relaxes and domes upwards again. Now, the volume of the torso is decreased, and so air is forced out of the lungs. Simple. Mind you, I say that. I always thought it was the lungs themselves that sucked in the air. Well, you were wrong. It's worth knowing what's really going on, as this is a common subject in exams. Hmm. But wait a minute. Why is the air going into the lungs a different colour to the air coming out? Well, it's not really. That's just to show us that when we breathe in air, we're exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. So do we know how much oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide? Well, it's usually around 4% of the gas present in breath. Only 4%? Seems like a lot of hard work for very little reward to me. Well, that's probably why we need to take about 16 breaths per minute, even when we're not exercising. So how do our lungs get oxygen out of the air we breathe? Well, this is where the round structures called alveoli come in. But first, the air has to get to them. How does that happen? Air gets drawn down the trachea. The trachea then splits into two tubes called bronchi, each one going to a lung. The bronchi then split into progressively smaller tubes called bronchioles. At the end of these tubes are the little air sacs called alveoli. Hmm. Things are about to get complicated again, I can tell. So how do they work? It's really not that tricky. Look. Just remember that oxygen needs to get into our bloodstream. And it does this through gaseous exchange, which happens in the alveoli. Waste carbon dioxide diffuses out of the bloodstream and into the alveoli, ready to be breathed out. This is replaced with oxygen, which diffuses into the bloodstream. So the alveoli enable the oxygen from the air we breathe to diffuse into our blood and the carbon dioxide to diffuse out. This is gaseous exchange. Yes. The alveoli perform a very special role in keeping us alive and they have special features to help them do this. Firstly, because they are rounded structures instead of flat, they have an enormous surface area of about 90 meters squared, which is roughly the size of your science lab. Secondly, they have a moist lining which allow gases to dissolve. 
Thirdly, they have very thin walls. In fact, the air and the blood are only separated by two layers of cells. And finally, they have a very good blood supply, as you can see. So they all have an enormous surface area, a moist lining, thin walls, and a rich blood supply, which all allow for gaseous exchange. Yes. So if you had an exam question which read, write down four ways in which the structure of the lungs allow for gaseous exchange to take place, you'd know all the answers. Ah, but what we haven't talked about is how smoking affects this whole process. Well, I can tell you right from the start that smoking does nothing to help the process. Cigarettes contain chemicals which are no good for the body, including nicotine. Well, I know that nicotine is highly addictive. Yes, it also interferes with the body's natural defence mechanisms. In what way? Our nose and windpipe are covered in tiny little hairs called cilia, which move in a wavy motion. See? OK. Now, the cilia are covered in a stream of mucus, which traps dust and germs, and the wavy motion carries them away from the lungs. I see. The heat and chemicals from cigarette smoke can destroy the cilia, and so dust and germs get into the lungs. This means that the bronchioles may become infected by a disease we know as bronchitis. Sounds nasty. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mucus from the damaged cilia also collects in the alveoli. This may lead to the walls of the alveoli being damaged, reducing their capacity for gaseous exchange. This disease is called emphysema. Oh dear. We haven't even got to lung cancer yet. Absolutely. Lung cancer is where the cells in the lung divide uncontrollably. Just a little fact for you. Nine out of ten lung cancer patients smoke. So I don't think anyone can argue that it's big or clever. And that's not all. Nicotine can cause an increase in blood pressure, which increases the chances of suffering from a heart attack or a stroke. My word! So why on earth do people do it then? I have no idea, especially when you consider that if you start smoking in your teens, by the time you're 60, you will have spent probably in excess of £80,000. 